Welcome to the next module of globalization and uh, culture. In this module, we are going to focus on globalization of fiction. When we look at fiction, uh, we are not going to look at fiction in the sense of the novel, but also narratives of other kind. We are looking at stories. Today, we talk about the huge market for Indian fiction in English in the West and that is often cited as an example of the globalization of fiction. Not only is the global uh, publish, publishing industry uh, uh, a recent phenomena, uh, but also the idea that writers do not belong to nations, but belong to the entire world. So, people talk about writers in English rather than writers, Indian writers in English. But before I tell you that story, we are going to visit, I am going to take you through a story in which stories travel not from, from the east to the west, but also from the west to the east and different directions several centuries ago. Uh, in when we look at these stories and how they traveled in the era of uh, very little, very poor communication and uh, less frequency of travel, we are amazed at the, at, the, at the kind of stories and the number of stories that traveled across the world from different parts, one part of the world to another part of the world. Uh, you are probably aware that stories from the East, much before writers like Salman Rushdie and Vikram Seth and Arundhati Roy became the darlings of the global publishing industry, uh, stories from India had been circulating in the West for several centuries. In fact, uh, stories from the Panchatantra and Jatakas uh, are believed to have uh, been incorporated in Western collections of stories such as the Decameron or the Canterbury Tales, which or, or in the same way as stories from the Arabian Nights, the Thousand and One Nights find their way into uh, different collections. I am going to take you to the travels of stories from Persia and the Middle East to India, the travels of Dastan and Kisse in beginning uh, in different centuries, dates have been suggested, but some say as early as the 6th century AD. Now, when we talk about this, it will also help us to talk about the other great tradition, which we said was suppressed in the production of Indian national culture in the 1930s, namely the Persia Arabic great tradition. Uh, although this uh, Persia Arabic great tradition has influenced not just fiction, but all other genres, including film, uh, music, poetry, uh, painting, and so on, food, uh, we we will use uh, we will use fo uh, fiction to focus on the uh, the great influence of Persia Arabic tradition on Indian culture, uh, beginning with the birth of the Indian novel, not in English, but in Indian languages. So, let us look at this story. Kissa Khani Bazaar uh, translates as a street of storytellers and it has been in the news recently for the wrong reasons, for the number of terrorist attacks, for the blast, but for more frivolous reasons, because of its association with three of the iconic figures of the Hindi film industry, namely Dilip Kumar, Raj Kapoor, and Shah Rukh Khan, whose ancestors hail from that region. But uh, let us look at its importance to the formation, to the, to the, the role of the Persia Arabic tradition on Indian storytelling in general. and. Indian fiction in particular. William Dalrymple, the historian, says that in this street, the professional storyteller or Dastan Go would perform night long recitations from memory. Some of these would go on for seven or eight hours with only a short break. And here we have a picture 
1903 in Pakistan. Uh, it's by Gertrude Bell, and the location is Peshawar. Uh, you you have uh, a very uh, it's a picture of the sto uh, Kis Kisa Khani Bazaar, the Storytellers Bazaar, and the old Kabli Gate, where you have fruit sellers uh, commingling with one mingling with one another. And you have another picture here of the caravans arise uh, where um, uh, where the camel uh, where, where the, ca the the the, the Again, the Kabli Manza, uh, where the traders would uh, take um, would uh, would stop over in their journeys and halt there. So it's part of this whole trade uh, uh, circulation of trade. And as I had mentioned in the very beginning, that the carriers of trade, the Khana Badosh, were also the carriers of culture because on the trade routes, the land trade routes, they not just carried goods but also stories. And this is how Kissa and Dastan, two genres, Persian genres, found their way into India. Now, Dastan and Kissa are two separate genres in each initially, but they merge even by the time they travel to India to mean story in general. Dastan is defined by William Hanway as a form of orally recited prose romance, created, elaborated, or transmitted by professional narrators. And the most famous of these romances, the prose romances, is the Shahnami or the Persian Book of Kings by Firdosi, which was composed in the late 10th and early 11th century AD by Shah Tams, Tamasp. Now, a young scholar uh, from Colombia, Farina Mir, who has uh, an award-winning book on uh, vernacular traditions of Punjab, has traced the travels of the Kisse from Persia and um, the Middle East to North India, to first to Punjab, and then to North India. Uh, Anne Mary Schimmel, another scholar, traces the travels of the Dastan to 11th century AD. And Francis Pritchett, a uh, professor emerita and Columbia University, and a very renowned scholar on the Dastan and Urdu fiction in general, uh, says that one narrative in particular, the Kisai Hansa or Dastane Amir Hamsa, became more, far more popular in India than it had ever been in its homeland. Uh, some would go as far as to say that Kisse were found in the Deccan as early as the 6th century AD. Now let's look at the Hansa Nama. And Hansa Nama is a series of paintings based on the Dastane Hamira Hansa, which were commissioned by the Mughal Emperor Akbar. But I need to tell you how Mughal, the Mughal Emperor became a fan of an admirer, admirer of the Dastan. So, if we are to believe Farina Mir, the Kisse found uh, travel to first to Punjab, amalgamated with the local uh, narrative traditions and a new genre of the Indian Kissa. The Indo Indian Kissa was formed through the merging of the Punjabi Kisse, such as Hir Ranja and so on, with the Arabic Kisse to. to uh, to result in a hybrid form, a more Indian version of the Kisse. And from there, uh, she says that they travel to North India, to the court, the Mughal court of Delhi. And um, they were uh, the, the very pop, n not only popular uh, among the poets and storytellers, but the Emperor Akbar himself was extremely fond of the Dastan, and in fact, had them recited to himself very frequently. Not only that, he was very fond of narrating the Dastan, and he had the Kisse uh, visually represented in a series of paintings, which are called the Hamsa Nama. Now, let's look at the Hamsa Nama paintings. 
The Hansa Nama chronicles the fantastic adventures of Hansa as he and his band of heroes fight against the enemies of Islam. The stories from a long established oral tradition were written down in Persian, the language of the court, in multiple volumes. This illustration shows the witch Ankarut in the guise of a beautiful young woman who hopes to seduce the handsome king Malik Iraj, whom she's captured and tied to a tree. Hamsa Nama was commissioned between, uh, the Hamsa Nama paintings were painted between 1558 to 1573 and originally included 1400 huge folios, 770 folios spread across various collections uh, have been found. These, and these were arranged in 14 volumes kept in a huge box. On one side of a folio within a large gold flecked and color toned paper frame typically was a colorful painting about 69 centimeters long and 54 centimeters wide about 27 by 21 inches. And Hamsa Nama, all the Mughal emperors did not seem to be equally fond of the Hamsa Nama. In fact, the emperor Babur I called it one far-fetched lie opposed to sense and nature. Uh, he was against the recitation of the Dastans because he believed that they took attention away, diverted attention from reality. On the other hand, by Akbar's time, the adventures of Hamsa, a romance that never took a canonical form, had attracted the interest of diverse persons across the Islamic world for at least 500 years. In directing the creation of the Hansa Nama, Akbar invested greatly in enhancing the sensuousness of the adventures of Hamsa. An official and dominant language of Akbar's court was Persian. The Hamsa Nama was constructed to be used as a complement to oral storytelling. So we had the Dastans which recited by the Dastan Go. Um, and these dastans, these recitations were accompanied by the showing of the paintings. They were used to complement the oral storytelling. The large size of the Hansa Nama's paintings makes them visually interesting at much greater distance than usual manuscript paintings. While Persian illustrated manuscripts typically integrate the text into the paintings, most Hamsa Nama folios follow an Indian manuscript style of having a painting on one side on a of a folio and the text on the other. However, unlike the folios that in a typical in Indian illustrated manuscript, almost every Hamsa Nama has a painting on one side. Hamsa Nama is organized episodically uh, with a painting on the front of the one folio corresponding to the text on the back of another. Each text page typically includes a formal opening so that the text page and the corresponding painting define an episodic structure for the story as a whole. Available evidence suggests that the folios were not bound but kept in boxes. An assistant could display the painting on one folio while the storyteller, assisted by the text on another folio, narrated an episode. The audience for a story told with the Hansa Nama might never see any text. The paintings and text were created and combined to be tools for oral storytelling. And uh, so basically what I'm trying to say is that just like uh, I'm trying to take forward uh, Mir's thesis in the context of painting, and not an original argument, but this has been made by visual scholars, scholars of art, who suggest that as in the case of the restitution of the kisse, which were uh, hybridized uh, with local demotic kisse to form a new genre of the kissa in India, similarly, the paintings also borrowed equally from Persian and Indian painting visual aesthetics to uh, produce a new genre of painting in the Hamsa Nama paintings. What is Hamsa Nama? So Hamsa Nama is essentially literature of action. 
It stimulates sense across sensory modes and at an early level of making sense. As told in Akbar's court, the adventures of Hamsa drew upon the oral tradition of Persian epics. The stu study of this tradition noted, Persian epic lit literature is a literature of action. The emphasis is not on human character development or accidents of fate, but on human action. The characters are generally preparing to fight, actually fighting or celebrating after a fight. Whatever they are doing, action is the focus of the story. A focus on action connects senses such as sight and sound. The lines of epic poetry should ring like a sword on a shield or a hammer on an anvil, not like a carillon in a bell tower. Episodes in the Hamsa Nama are about this kind of action. Consider this text from the Hamsa Nama. When they, Hamsa, also called the Amir and Umar, were walking, they came across the Jahannuma Tower. By chance, Ghazan Far was atop the tower, drinking wine with a group of ill-starred infidels. When his gaze fell upon the Amir and Umar, he cursed them loudly. Umar cursed them return, but the Amir said, If you are a man, come down and let's grapple to see who will win a match of courage. The corresponding Hansanama painting shows in the upper left Gazanfar atop a tower. I'm sorry, I don't have the painting. I just used an example, but I'll try to get the painting for you if it's possible. Now, this uh, Dastans were recited by a, a kind of hereditary storytellers called the Dastan Go, who would uh, who would recite Dastans or Kista, Kissa Khan, who would. Th this uh, story, um, this st storytelling tradition of Dastan Goi has recently been revived, and I will show you how it's been revived. So, the Dastan Goi in Delhi, according to Francis Pritchett, uh, the Urdu Kissa, according to her, began in Delhi around 1830 and probably died in 1928 with the demise of the last Dastan Go, Meer Bakr Ali. Dastan Goi was, however, moved to Lucknow and Rampur with the, with the, with the collapse of the, the royal power in Delhi. It, the, the art of Dastan Goi traveled to Lucknow. And this, during this period that the Dastan was, uh, uh, was transcribed, we'll go into that story later, but the, a new Dastan, an Indo-Islamic Dastan was produced at this time by a Dastan go called Mir Ahmed Ali which has later been exposed to be a major hoax. Because Mir Ahmed Ali, one of the most gifted Dastan goes of Lucknow, who had a huge following in Lucknow, in Nawad, uh, claimed that he had heard this Dastan from Faizi, who was a Dastan go in Akbar's court. But that story gra later came to be this proved that there was no Dastan go by the name of Fezi in Akbar's, Akbar's court. And this was entirely in concoction on, beha on, on the part of Mir Ahmed Ali. Uh, he used this trick to lend authenticity to his own Dastan, which he called Atilisme Hoshruba. In his uh, two, this was carried on by his two disciples. Uh, Differences between Mir Ahmed Ali and his disciples, which were partly created when the book was being transcribed and written down, led to Mir Ahmed Ali's departure for, Luck for the court of Rampur from Lucknow. Now, the Dastan in print uh, is part of the oral. It was part of the oral tradition for a long time, as we said. It travelled as early as sixth century A.D., according to some to the Deccan and to 11th century AD, to the 
north of India. Uh, so it's been part of an oral tradition for several centuries, and dastans were recited in Persian, as we saw that Persian was the court language of uh, Akbar, and continued to be the, the, the official language for several centuries. Now gradually, pass, we, we move from the Persian dastan to the Urdu dastan. Uh, so, uh, when we're talking about the earlier recitations, we're talking about the Dastan in Persian, and then we have the Dastan in Urdu. And it's this, uh, uh, it carries forward till the eight, eight, nine, into the 19th century, uh, when uh, in the Fort William College Press, it's published in 1789, and apparently the Fort William College even had a kissa corn on its roads, on its roads, on its roads. So the first uh, compilation of the Dastan -e Amir Hansa, which uh, Richard tells us was one of the most popular Dastan in India, wo took place between 1893 and 1908, and it's coeval. It's also marks the beginning of the printing, um, the, the one of the earliest indigenous printing presses in India, namely the Munshi Naval Kishore Press in India. And what the first book to be have to have been published by the press was, which was the Dastan e Amir Hansa between 1893 and 1908. Uh, so sorry, not 1893 and uh, 1908, between 1865 and 1880, which had 46 volumes. Now, the story of the, the writing down of the transcription of the Dastan is itself the stuff of fiction about how the Dastan, as we have it, the, the copies of the Dastan, Neamir Hamsa, transcribed in 1865 to 1880 that we have, are based on different versions because the first version was commissioned uh, and uh, asked um, Mir Ahmed Ali, the person we met earlier, was asked commission to write the transcribed dastans, being the most famous dastan go of Lucknow. But as the between in these years, in these this 15 year period, a uh, lot of water flowed under the bridge. The dissensions between Mir Ahmed Ali's own uh, ill health the dissension between him and his disciples and uh, uh, Munshi, uh, the Naval Kishore Press assigning um, his disciples the task of transcribing uh, the Dastan -e Amir Hansa when Mir Ahmed Ali was not able to deliver on time and Mir Ahmed Ali's gradual exit from Lucknow. So we have different uh, the, the, this this uh, version of the Dastan, which itself is based on different versions of Mir Ahmed Ali and his two disciples. Now, a Canadian scholar called Musharraf Ali Farooqi has recently translated the Tilis Mehoshruba, and his introduction tells us the story of how the Dastan came to be written down and how these 46 volumes of the Dastan were written down and published by the Munshi Naval Kishore Press. Now, it's the Dastan which had a tremendous, uh, it's, it's, it's seminal to, the, to all forms of Indian narrative, not just fiction, but also film, storytelling, theater, drama, they all have been influenced by the Dastan in different ways. So if one stream of storytelling comes to India from the West, another stream of storytelling has always been indigenous. But there has been an inordinate, uh, disproportionate fo focus or uh, em emphasis on the Sanskritic oral traditions of India or the folk Hindu traditions of India, whereas the parallel streams of storytelling which came from which form part of the Persia Arabic great tradition and the other great other little traditions of India have been marginalized in the production of this history uh, of Indian narrative traditions which have not excluded but have marginalized these the great 
uh, Persia Arabic tradition, which has formed along with the Sanskritic core, the parallel core of Indian narrative art whether it is visual, whether it is verbal or whether it is cinematic, these traditions have tremendously influenced uh, the uh, all genres of narrative in India. So, the first example of the influence of Dastan apart from the transcription of Dastan it's itself and it is forming the first printed uh, a book by the Naval Kishore Press but, uh, and also Fort William College Press earlier is that the one of the earliest, not the first, but one of the earliest Indian novels in English by Devaki Nandan Khatri called Chandrakanta is displays the direct influence of Dastan. Um, we, it's, we also told that uh, the Nawab Wajid Ali Shah of Awad ha was, uh, was a great uh, admirer of the Dastans and the, he even uh, it, the influence of Dastan was evident in the play Indra Sabha which was performed in his court. Now, with uh, the, with, uh, with the uh, poets, courtesans, musicians, writers uh, from and the munshis who migrated from the court of Awadh to Parsi theatre uh, with the collapse of the court of Awadh and the loss of royal patronage, uh, Dastan travelled to Parsi theatre and from Parsi theatre which has strongly influenced Indian cinema, it travelled to Indian Hindi cinema. So, the Dastan told tales of heroic romance and adventure stories about gallant princes and their encounters with evil kings enemy champions, demons, magicians, jinns, divine emissaries, tricky secret agents called liars and beautiful princesses who might be human or of the Pari race is how Pritchett defines the Dastan and uh, she says Razm or Buzz are the most essential features of a Dastan. Razm is as assembly and Buzz means um, poetry. While, thus, while no, novels aspire to represent reality, the whole effort. So, we are looking at Dastan as a predecessor of fiction, of novel as a genre. Before we move on to the globalization of fiction and show how Indian folk fiction interrogates any idea of national boundaries and uh, is composed by a new group of writers who I call global cosmopolitans we are going to look at how the predecessor of the novel itself in India was part of this cross fertilization of cultures and was part of an early era of an earlier global process. So, while novels aspire to represent reality, we will we'll explore the difference between Dastan and novel uh, later in detail, but the, full, the main difference is that while novels aspire to represent reality, the whole effort in Dastans is directed towards shutting it out as hermetically as possible. The second half of the 18th century, Mughal Empire was in decline and men who knew no other code, including those who were daily offending against it, could escape from the sordid reality around them into the world of the Dastans where everything was splendidly simple. We will conclude with a very brief uh, recitation of a Dastan by a duo who have revived the art, the ancient, ancient art of storytelling in India. I would invite you to watch the, the brief video for a couple of minutes. Thank you. दास्तान की दुनिया में बहुत सी सुनाई गई पर उनमें सबसे मशहूर हुई अमीर हमजा की दास्तान अमीर हमजा हुजूर पाक मोहम्मद सल्लल्लाहु अलैहि वसल्लम के चचा लगते हैं और उनके बाप खाजा अब्दुल मुत्तलिब काबा के सरदार हैं और उनकी कारनामे उनकी शुजात उनकी बहादुरी जवामर्दी के किस्से और कहानियां कोई 13 सालों से दुनिया भर में सुनाई जाती रही हैं और आज आप तक भी पहुंचेंगी 
وہ داستان شروع ہوتی ہے اس وقت سے جب دنیا کا سب سے بڑا بادشاہ ایران کا بادشاہ نوشیروان تھا اس نے ایک خواب دیکھا اس نے لوگوں سے پوچھا کہ اس خواب کی تعبیر کیا ہے تو اس کے وزیر نے اس سے کہا کہ اس خواب کی تعبیر یہ ہے کہ آپ کی سلطنت پہ بہت بڑا خطرہ آنے والا ہے خطرہ منڈرا رہا ہے آپ کی سلطنت آپ سے چھن سکتی ہے اس نے پوچھا اس کا علاج کیا ہے اس نے کہا سرزمین عرب میں ایک بچہ پیدا ہوا ہے وہ اور اس کے دوست مل کے آپ کی سلطنت کو بچائیں گے وہ اپنے وزیر کو وہاں بھیجتا ہے وزیر وہاں جاتا ہے اور جتنے نوزائیدہ بچے ہیں جو بھی بھی پیدا ہوئے ہیں ان سب کو منگواتا ہے جب خواجہ عبد المطلب کا بیٹا ان کے سامنے لایا جاتا ہے تو وہ اسے گود میں دیکھ لے کے اس کی پیشانی دیکھ کے پہچان لیتے ہیں اور کہتا ہے کہ یہ امیر حمزہ ہے یہ اپنے زمانے کا سب سے ایماندار سب سے سچا سب سے بہادر سب سے جری آدمی ثابت ہوگا اس کی شجاعت اور جوان تو عظیم پیش ہے داستان بھیجنا افراسیاب کا نامہ مہتاب جادو کو اور مرنا اس کا ایار ان کے ہاتھ تو جیسا کہ روایت ہے داستان گوئی کی شروعات ساکی نامے سے یعنی شراب پلانے والے کی تعریف سے نازوں کے اٹھانے والے ساکی رندوں کے چھکانے والے ساکی آباد تجھی سے انجمن ہے آرائش محفل سخن ہے پھر رن ہوئے ہیں تیرے بیتا ایک اور دے جام باد نام وہ جام جو رش کے جام جم ہو وہ میں کہ نہ جس کا نشا کم ہو وہ نشا کی جو دکھائے میں رنگ تقریر میں ہو تلسم کا ڈھنگ وہ آج پلا دے جام ساقی جس میں کی ہو تیرا نام ساقی اقلی میں سخن کو میں کروں سر مداح رہے میرے سخنور زینت دہے باغ کامرانی اے جا بنے میری کہانی وہ پھول جھڑے میری زبا سے ہر صفحہ نہ کم ہو بوستاں سے مشتاق ہیں اہل بزم اے جا سب دیکھ رہے ہیں دیر سے راہ آغاز بیاں کرو یہاں سے رونق دو سخن کو داستاں سے تو گلگونا کشانے آرز شاہد بیان اس طرح فرماتے ہیں کہ جو جانتا ہے سو جانتا ہے جو نہیں جانتا سو جان لے کہ تلسموں میں تلسم ہے تلسم ہوش ربا کہ جس کا بادشاہ اور مالک ہے افراسیاب کہ جس کی عملداری میں ساٹھ ہزار ملک جادوگر اور جادوگرنیوں کے آباد ہیں کہ بادشاہ ان ملکوں کے سب افراسیاب کے مدی و منقاد ہیں اور اس تلسم میں اس کے بنوائے ہوئے تلسم ہوش ربا میں تین حصے اور مقام ہے پہلا حصہ اس تلس میں ہوش ربا کا ہے پردہ ظلمات یعنی اندھیرے کا پردہ کہ جس کے پیچھے افراسی آپ کے بزرگ بڑے بڑے ساحر اور جادوگر ہر وقت جادوگروں کے خدا سامری اور جمشید کی عبادت اور تپسیا میں مصروف رہتے ہیں اور نئے نئے جادو انعام میں پاتے ہیں اور دوسرا حصہ اس تلسم ہوش ربا کا ہے تلسم باطن یعنی نظروں سے چھپا ہوا تلسم کہ جہاں افسر سپہ سالار عہدے دار بڑے بڑے لوگ رہتے ہیں اور تیسرا حصہ اس کا ہے تلسم ظاہر یعنی نظروں کے سامنے کا تلسم جہاں ریایا برایا اور عام لوگ رہتے ہیں ظاہر اور باطن تلسم کے درمیان سہر 